There we go. Back to the top of resources, and uh, we have slide sets here. And let's open up the slide set for uh, Handy Chapter 2. He says patiently. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is go a quick step through these, but pause. You've all seen these and you have comments of your own and questions and things that you think are sharing worthwhile. Please put them out there. And this is a good thing to leave behind those questions. I think it also helps for that notional future participant student who's trying to figure out, oh, how do I take this course on my own? Uh, what were they talking about back then? So uh, a comment we've already gotten and uh, is, well, a lot of this is just basic history of computer science. And uh, that perspective would not be the one to take going in here. Is it? Well, yes, but he goes, and, and you, when you think of all the hundreds, maybe thousands of things that Hanny could say about, well, what's important about hardware, I think it's very telling the things he focuses on and sometimes the things he just skips. Why, if we ask why, he starts with, uh, well, signaling. What does it mean to go from analog to digital. It was very curious back in those days. A lot of folks were extremely comfortable with analog, filtering, signaling, pulses, sine waves, and digital was kind of newish. Now it's quite the opposite. Most people are familiar with digital and, and not so familiar with that funky old analog stuff. Yet both are there, both are yin and yang. Uh, he points out that it wasn't until we did that that it was essentially Neither the analog nor the digital was better. It was noise. Noise was the controlling factor. And uh, you rarely read that in any of the signaling stuff, that the ability to strip out noise over not just long distance, but arbitrary distance was the game changer in terms of making communication scalable and repeatable. Uh, I think it's in our link list of references, and that's... Uh, um, a wonderful book that goes through those kinds of things and how they ripple out is uh, being digital. And I'll make sure that's in the notes. Uh, it was by uh, Nicholas Negroponte in uh, the 90s, uh, covered a lot of his uh, Wired Magazine articles and how that played out. Questions, comments? Boom, next, uh, why? Well, of course, integrated circuits. But he's talking often here to electrical engineers, what mattered. People were just getting a grasp on Moore's law. Now it seems kind of magical or just we're used to it. It's something that, that works. But it isn't interesting that heat dissipation and current disruption, that has a whole new thing. Uh, uh, can anybody give a order of magnitude on how much power today is being consumed by data centers? Isn't it like 7% of uh, all power generated in the United States? About yeah, the same as yeah. it's like it's like more than a large fraction of all the nations on earth uh, uh, and how much heat is that and is it global warming a contributor or not well it's gotten to the percentages where yeah it does and um, maybe that's bad why are we quiet about it well I can see where data center might not want to talk about it 
uh, what are the trade-offs? Oh, maybe those data centers are actually saving energy by not having lots of smaller inefficient ones everywhere. Who's done that trade-off analysis? Um, anyone else? Okay, so everything old is new again and maybe old again too. These issues never go away. They just kind of spin around and change. Let's go to the next one. Uh, why has this revolution happened? Science has moved material good to information. Boy, there were all sorts of books and stories and talk about it back in that day. What does it mean to be an information society? And uh, it was almost magical in terms of its impact and prognosticators would talk about things. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's flip to today. If you open up today's paper, what do you read? You, you read stuff like, we're shut down. The, the bottom's falling out of the market. Will businesses be able to reopen? Can we do anything anymore? Are we going to run out of food? Oh, wait, they're plowing under food because they can't distribute it. What's going on? Nobody knows. So uh, I would submit to you that we're again going through the same revolution and uh, same kinds of revolution, maybe not in the giant large of industrial, from agricultural onward into factories, onward into information, but Just in a matter of weeks, it's been game changing. Comments, please. So I'd say this current aspect of the shutdown is going to be a revolution of efficiency. As companies across the world realize the essential employees, the non-essential employees, and how much work they can actually get done remotely and with a smaller staff. We saw that kind of the post-2008-2009 crash when a bunch of companies fired uh, large amounts of employees because they realized they could do more with less and maybe pay their people a little bit more for higher productivity, but they didn't need as large of staffs. So I, that's what I kind of see out of this whole COVID shutdown. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Pressing on. Same story, <laughs> ongoing. Uh, oh, uh, wow, robots. Last week's article was how people are less afraid of the robots, they're happy they're there to take care of things while they're locked home. Um, we have emerged from the AI winter in the last few years where it's just out there and once again we're asking Gee, where does all this stuff go? How much does it change? Uh, what's it all about? Um, same kinds of revolutions. So let's, uh, let's drill down. Uh, uh, what I think is uh, significant is from a Hamming perspective is that he connected these different things. The, why did the hardware change to how does it impact society to John, your last point, gee, did, are people saving money? Is that the tipper? And once you, once you tip, can you go back? And these are some of the larger patterns where you realize that, you know, these are just not different random disconnected forces, but they are all interrelated. And, uh, uh, just when you think you've caught up, then Hamming revs it to the next level, and it means, oh, yeah, yeah, this is all about design. This is what changes, because um, maybe a more contemporary rephrase is uh, your, the way you act changes. It's the understanding of the problem evolves. The rephrase. 
uh, what are we really trying to do here? What, are, are we draining a swamp? Are we just getting water? Are we improving the ecology? Or are we trying to remove non What are we trying to do here? It changes. Uh, the design rises, morphs, adapts to deal with the goals. So um, comments, questions on those couple slides, please. I, I could use more col colorful language, but I usually think as an instructor that uh, if I'm not getting a response, I haven't <clears throat> irritated people enough. <laughs> Can I help move anybody out of their comfort zone or do you want to press on? Okay, let's press on. You've been warned. Um, effects on sci computers on science. It's really cool reading his uh, uh, text on how do we, his, his managers at Bell Labs, he tried to tell them, you know what, you're going to do a lot more simulation than you ever did before. You're going to use computers a lot more than you ever did before. All the way to uh, maybe we should do more work and did you know by measuring the trends and looking that we're on this curve and oh, there's some guy, Gordon Moore, talking about this kind of thing. And uh, I, I particularly enjoyed his vignette on uh, for the for the managers who are trying to manage the budget. Well, we can't afford this. We can't do this. And it doesn't equal our plan. And and uh, and. Uh, then he talks about how he responded to the response to the managers. Well, yes, of course you're right, but uh, we'll keep recording the numbers and make sure we're doing the right thing. And, uh, but you're right, sir. And we'll keep going. And uh, knowing full well that they were wrong about the outcomes, but they were right about the motivation. So, oh, it's almost like the design is changing to meet the different requirements. And so, I hope you tuck that one away, that technique away about how to be out there into something new and convince others, even when it's different from what they want, that, uh, oh, this is going to have an impact. Hands raised to anyone? Okay. Simulation and modeling, paying attention to things. I'm not going to regurgitate all of those. Note that uh, for a long, long time, simulation, modeling, were terms that were not totally well understood. But uh, a great clarifying, let me make sure I'm on the right screen here. Are we getting the share screen now? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Simulation is actually the behavior of a model over time. So uh, it's always good to see these two in tandem and the ability to model. You see echoes here in modeling of him saying uh, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. Oh, insight is our understanding. Our model is a representation of the world. The simulation is the behavior over time. Once again, all these things are interrelated. And uh, uh, I hope when you're reading these, you're seeing the same kind of resonance as to your own topic or just your own understanding of things that it has to be holistic. Great point. Comments, please. Don, this is Marty, comment. Uh, back in the late 70s, 
be without discussions of hamming, I was into modeling of something that I couldn't adequately test. Um, it was acoustics, um, trying to understand multipath acoustics for torpedoes. And the, some people just wanted to go theoretical, easy math. We didn't have the power of the computers back then. A lot of Hamming's, in my opinion, a lot of Hamming's uh, reason for pushing to simulation was the big problems that he was interested in, you couldn't solve it any other way besides simulating it. So to Hamming, modeling and simulation was the way of working on important problems because all of the other ways seem to not work. I like that. And I'll add in, I think the follow on is the modeling and simulation aspects where you may be able to do some of the other work without it can be so much less expensive. Think about what it takes to build even a small robot. I mean, you're buying a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, labor to put together a couple thousand dollars worth of metal and plastic. And if you want to test a whole bunch of things, you can't build 200 robots to test different variations. But if you model 200 robots, maybe you could knock it down to three or four that you actually have to put together real later. And so even though we can do things, it might be better to do things with the modeling simulation now first rather than after the fact. And there's uh, no shortage of uh, uh, Kenny Wise pound foolish going on even today. And uh, certainly uh, as members of a double bureaucracy, the military and an academic institution, everybody here is well familiar with that. Uh, and uh, it's only frustrating because you're all motivated and want to keep going. So it's part of the nature of things, part of the nature of humans, and how do we move past that? He talks about it. Let's look at um, um, another point on the slide and keep pressing on. Uh, uh, are we seeing the screen now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay, so it takes a couple seconds. There we go. Uh, now, this, of course, is the distillation. This is not uh, Hamming's exact words. This is the high points. But I think it's really interesting whenever he talks about instability, unstable designs, right at the edge of instability. Certainly, uh, uh, chaotic behaviors were well understood there. Certainly, Unknowns and unknowns, unknowns were well understood. Uh, uh, notice what he's really talking about here. He's talking about how do we know what we don't know? How do we tell if, if this is just wrong or if it's in an in-between space or we have a partial view of it? And, uh, you know, coming from somebody who is so accurate in probability and statistics and trying to measure and quantify uncertainty, the ability to recognize that, oh, oh, uh, you can't engineer it if the science isn't right. <laughs> you, if your science is wrong and your engineering is confirming what is actually wrong, that's bad. He doesn't pick a side again. He just says, oh, it's an essential component of good design. It lets you do things in your design you couldn't do before. Oh, okay. So if you're not thinking in terms of, if, you're th if you think your, your capabilities are gated by, uh, boy, this really needs to be a lot better switching back and forth between the video. If you think your abilities are gated by, limited by, what can you think? 
then you haven't yet internalized the notion of, oh, oh, my thinking powers are greater than just what I can do sitting in a chair. I, I can put this computer to work for me. I can express something as a model. I can push its boundaries, test it, try to break it, say, is it unstable? Is it wrong? If I give it unexpected inputs, will it go to a new place? Oh, that's you thinking. That's the art of engineering. That's our capabilities are greater, greater than ever before. So those are the larger points you want to try to pull out of what is Hamming trying to tell people? Because everybody's very comfortable with where they're at. And he's, he keeps trying to tell us, even today, I think, there's more. There's more to what you can do. Back to you guys. Yeah, well, the, and putting all that together with the insight aspects, I had a perplexing, and, and I was surprised because I was corresponding with somebody who I thought would have known a whole lot more about this. But uh, there's, there's folks who are complaining about, oh, well, the models for the COVID-19 are all, go, all gorped up because they didn't predict the right number of deaths. And I'm just like utterly stunned going, well, gee, you know, A, you've got garbage in, garbage out problems. But B, those models aren't even designed to do a number thing. And then you go back to Hamming. Like, well, are you trying to come up with the number? Or are you trying to learn what's going on? And the follow-on um, complaint about them was, oh, well, they, they really change really, really fast. You know, they're unstable. It's like, okay, well, we're dealing with exponential curves. Small changes in coefficients kind of do that kind of thing. So the reaction was, well, if they're unstable, they're useless. Like, Wait a minute. If they're not, un if they're unstable, they're not useless. They tell you when not to do something. Because if it goes crazy, and the crazy part is where you don't want to go, now you know the number to avoid. Okay, stay on this side of the number. Don't go to that side because it blows up there. And so there's, even now, in 2020, an amazing misconception on what models even mean and what they do from some really, really, really smart people. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, jo you know, George Box says, you know, the famous quote, you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Um, and, you know, the thing with the whole COVID thing is, you know, while the projections of kind of that max number or whatever are incorrect, what, you know, what, you, what do you get from those models? What did they get? Well, they got an idea of, you know, how prepared they needed to be, even if they overprepared, they had an idea of kind of what the general trend of the curve would look like, you know, that it's gonna go up sharply and then, you know, it's gonna start to hopefully level out and then, you know, and then start to come back down. And we had that, it's just the magnitude was off by many orders. <laughs> um, well, but, uh, and there's part of the thing is, was the magnitude off or was the original model? Well, if you don't do anything, this is what's going to happen. And so we did stuff. Yeah. Right. That doesn't break the first model, because if we didn't do anything, it would have blown up that way. Right. You never know where it would be, right? I mean, you don't. That's part of. Yeah. You know, and, there, and there's so many unknowns in, in other things. And then it follows on with, well, but these models don't have any uh, linkage to economic theory. And I was just dumbfounded by, by that next comment. It's like, well, gee, when in human history have they ever thought about doing this before? Oh, well, why can't they just build them? Because uh, nobody even knows how to make one yet because we're living it for the first time. Well, what good are models if we're doing it the first time? I'm just like holding my head. Like, where do you start? You know, if you can't be done, well, Jesus, no, it's not useless. But really, it was a really interesting conversation yesterday. And then it kind of went cold and dark yeah. because suddenly the, the naysaying ran out of ammunition. But That's right. Uh, as you gave that example, Lauren, I'm thinking, okay, so let's say 
not that I'd ever do this. I don't have to go anywhere anymore. But you buy a new car. You say, yeah, you'll get at least 40 miles a gallon. And then you drive it around and uh, you get 50 miles a gallon. You say, oh, their model was awful. It was terrible. I got much better than that. I'm bringing that car back. I'm going to tell them, your model is terrible. It stinks. That's kind of like, uh, oh, we had the curve is growing half as fast as the worst case extreme predicted before. It's not that the model is wrong. As you said here, uh, uh, Lauren, it's that, oh, the model lets us understand the relationships and think differently. We're learning to learn. We're the insights. letting the computers expect insight once again. Thank you. All right. Um, so we can keep going on and, and we will. Let's keep pressing on a few more slides here and uh, knock out this chapter. There's some more good things. I'm skipping around a little bit. Um, when he had when he had the questions in there. John, you want to share? In his chapter about. Sure, let's backtrack. Marty, go ahead. I'm sorry, I need you to share the screen. Stand by. They successfully hidden the menu from me again. Not sure what I'm doing wrong. Is it unshared now? Not yet. Anybody else see the slides? Negative. I'm going to reshare and try yeah. to unshare. It worked. OK, Keep that got the interface. All right, all yours, Marty. OK, uh, I thought back to. Uh, okay. And the sure went away. Um, uh, back to Hamming. Uh, a model is an attempt to understand some phenomenology. It's not causality. One of the things I had to do with Hamming was show that a model is not unique. Most of people in school, when they got to algebra and equations, were working with closed form equations, and they call that a model. Here's a parabola, here's a hyperbola, here's the volume of a rhomboid surface. Those are closed form math. People call those models, but in fact, they're mathematical closed form equations. Models attempt to simulate some of the interesting behavior of a problem, but it's not the problem and it's not unique. So I think there is a disconnect in people's heads when they say, oh, we have a model for this. They're thinking of a closed form equation. Uh, a model makes certain assumptions. It uses finite data. The real underlying conditions may be different a week later. A model is usually time invariant when we do least squares modeling or curve fitting we're freezing certain variables because we don't know what happens when they change. We may even be assuming linearity when in fact it's not. But a model is a, um, a set of techniques to gain insight. It is not a closed form, so there, this is the answer forever. I just want to make that point because I I lived through that 30 plus years ago. And we've lost other people. Thank you. Okay, let's get the right screen back up. How's that looking? 
Good. Okay. So, uh, uh, good and bad. How far will machines go? Well, what's wrong with that sentence? How far will machines and humans go? The pattern of us working together with them. Answer, forget about it. It'll keep going and going and going. And our understanding of the problem refactors the design. It keeps going and going and going. Uh, uh, what a uh, former uh, uh, key player in this uh, whole hamming endeavor was Jeff Weekly, used to work at MPS. He has a great line uh, about search. And there's a question, and uh, if you haven't seen this in your day-to-day -day life, uh, you're not paying attention, but question comes up. Why wonder ever again? You can just look it up and type in the search and get it back. And um, the flip side of that, let's get a gesture on the video. The flip side of that is if you can't ask the question and get an answer, if you can't get that answer out there so others can ask the question and get the answer, then whatever your work is or your points of interest are, they're invisible. They're not findable. They're not there yet. So as how far will humans and computers go goes everywhere, oh, it's no longer a matter of degree. It's a matter of, oh, that's the playing field now. So you have to uh, extrapolate these things. And uh, I could have said the same thing from an information, information war perspective. Uh, you guys are experts on all this stuff, so we're going to press on. But uh, here he not too frequently, but he did hear reverts back to religion. You won't see these in every chapter, not at all. But he's pointing out that whether you agree with it, whether you understand it, whether you like it or not, you own it. You own it. And if you're going to believe something, you have the responsibility to live with it, to do something about it, convince others to act yourself, to influence others' actions, because that's what you believe. If you don't, then you're not there. You're living the unexamined life. And I think he hammers this because of our roles of uh, as scientists, as engineers, trying to get people to understand what's happening and what matters. He's saying, you, if you're going to assert it and put it out there, you're responsible for it. you got to do something about it. So that's, that's pretty cool. Any uh, first-person stories people might want to uh, tell about that? Okay, fine. Let's uh, do the last section here, which is particularly interesting. Now, uh, he talks about S-shaped curves and how fundamental they are. Are you guys getting uh, the slide with the equation? Yes. Equations. Okay. So uh, what's an S-shaped curve? Well, uh, uh, when you have multiple variables and – sorry, my computer's personality took over there. Let's try again. And he works through the math and the fact that it has limits and uh, 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 you keep going, boom, Here's, here are the figures that matter a lot. He said, and he would draw this out in terms of, well, we figured this out and that out, and we, then we kind of got the upper bounds. And as time goes on, time going from left to right, for example, if it's time or if it's a trend X or whatever, and certain things play out, and then some of the key parameters, the key controlling factors change, and now we're on another S-curve going. And uh, then uh, he builds this out, and this is the thing that I found over and over again in the years to be really revealing. And uh, that is, 
of course, everything, when it's something new starts taking off, you're on the initial exponent part of the curve. And then things are rocking and moving ahead. And at some point, you start reaching the law of diminishing returns, and there's less bang for buck and less output for input and it's still growing but it's just not quite as much before and i think hammond's insight he's very articulate about this is oh oh and then you reach another threshold and it keeps going and now you're on a second curve and uh that second threshold is always hard to figure out but what he noticed in his experience when he said when he was describing this curve what is it that gets you from one curve to the next what are the changes in factors and what is it how do how do you know when you're at that horizontal line of oh oh we're not in a completely different universe but rather some of our factors have allowed our exponential growth curves to sidestep the previous limiting exponential curves that are just differential rate relationships and that you're always transitioning from one to the other because you're not, there's not sufficient motivation maybe or need to get to that second innovation until all the payoff has been mostly squeezed out of the first innovation. Uh, I'm going to add a slide here, uh, I think, well, I'm still debating on how best to do it. It might be that we would do annotations to his lectures, but nowadays, the way that is typically expressed, and uh, maybe somebody wants to pull it up in a different window. I've got too many windows. The hype curve. Gartner Consulting has done a great job over the years on a number of things describing business innovation and telling and selling that story. And uh, one of their curves, you've all seen it, you know, uh, here's the, the peak of inflated expectations and there's the trough of disillusionment. And there's the crossing the chasm until we get to the mature level of the technology. Everybody's familiar with that one. Fewer people use the double, triple S curves that Hamming uh, put forth. And I, I frankly find this one to be a lot more useful because you can, you can apply this to say, where are we now? What's going on in this problem area that I care about? And uh, are we starting to reach the law of diminishing returns yet? What are the controlling factors? is there a need for something new or if it if this if if the new thing appeared now nobody would really want to pay attention to it because um, uh, we're making too much progress already and we don't have to change okay, here's so Sam's next urban. insight into this let me let me have one more thing and then you've got it Lauren. Mm -hmm. uh I, I didn't segue well enough but here's Here's his other observation. Having observed a lot of this in the wild and starting on the first day, keeping numbers of how much are we spending, how much are we using, he said, I've noticed that that horizontal line usually occurs when you reach the factor of 10. Right around there, when you go to an order of magnitude, and uh, that's often when it happens. And he says, it's not just because of the engineering or, or the social, it's usually because of the economics, that a factor of 10 makes it economical, good business sense to refactor, to pay for that second innovation, to get on that next level and go. So I, I really commend this curve to you with those threshold motivators as way to look at larger trends what's going on can you influence something it's not enough to have the right answer could you make a difference where do you want to position yourself to have the kind of impact in your research that's where a lot of these questions play out and i think it's s curves not some hand wavy uh, 
marketing curve that is always right in retrospect and rarely useful in real time. Great. Okay, Lauren, you got the, the talk. I'm going to say the, the hype curves and the S curves serve completely different purposes. So I don't even think they're comparable in the least. Um, the hype curve is where you would go maybe talking to some group about money and yeah, mostly uh, on the backside of things. The S curves um, are describing the inexorable forward crush of whatever particular thing you're talking about. You know, and we're talking mostly about technologies. Um, I think when having talked about the 10 times, it wasn't that's when one S curve flattens out into the next. I think that's where one S curve can just summarily take over the old, you know, so if you, if the next one up, this up is 10 times better, it may take over early where if everything peters out, everybody's looking for whatever you can get out of the next thing. And it's going to, it's going to happen if it happens at all. And it doesn't have to be 10 times better. It just has to be able to improve. But if you're going to try and take over in the middle of one curve with the new tech, it's a, a big jump. Um, I've heard eight times from other people. So it's somewhere in that, that general eight to 10 times range for technology A to replace technology B during technology A's heyday. Now, when A is old and busted, somebody's going to be all over B in a heartbeat if it promises better for the future. Other comments? This is Marty. Uh, <clears throat> Hamming early on in his uh, speeches talks about a power of 10, factor of 10. He was working decimal until he really, you know, fell in love with binary um, and, and software and stuff like that. But working powers of 10, he made it, uh, it was understandable to people. The other thing about the S-curve, isn't it often a disruptive solution or a out of left field solution that makes the S-curve go up? I think it's the disruptive ones that are where you're eight to 10 times better because yeah. they're taking over from what's going on now. Uh, if you look at to take Intel and, and building chips for years and years and years, um, Moving to ultraviolet lithography to break, you know, what everybody thought was going to be the end of making new chips at 20 some nanometer size process. Um, that happened at the end. And Intel was the one driving that boat themselves internally. And there was no huge immediate jump. I mean, they followed the same, we're going to make everything 0.7 smaller every time around uh, and, and did that for another couple of generations of, of uh, CPUs. So there, they didn't have to have the big jump. They just did the next incremental thing. Well, the next incremental thing happened to be another S-curve that ran into its own set of issues and has got its peter out point and you move on to the next thing again after that. But if you're trying to take over in the middle of somebody's curve, you've got to have a, a big reason for folks to want to do so. And I think that's where the- Sure, so uh, the, the hype curve isn't wrong. It describes phenomena, but I've found that it's usually, a, it, and is different, but it's looking more backwards and you can maybe assess where you're at. I found the S-curves to be really useful for figuring out where are there sufficient economic drivers to get to the next level or not. And the factor of eight, factor of 10, that's really interesting because, hmm, eight. Eight equals three squared. Two to so the an third. order of magnitude, a nine factor is three of squared. 10. Nine is three squared, Pardon? two cubed. Yeah. Two, to the sorry, nine, two to the cube. Two, 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 thank two. you, thank you for inverting me. Yeah, momentary brain inversion. Two to the third is eight. Sorry, I wasn't trying to reinvent math here. Thank you. The uh, two to the third is eight. eight, pretty close to 10. 10 is an order of magnitude. Eight is, I've doubled three times. Hmm. Oh, can we, can we translate that 
doubling three times into time. Well, if you believe Moore's law, where uh, price performance uh, uh, doubles at a certain rate, well, we're 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 beneath um, eighteen months already in some chips for a sustained period of time. Okay, so if I double and it's less than eighteen months, and uh, oh. Oh, I think if you quick scratch it out on the back of the envelope, but I think if you get to every five years, Moore's law has pushed computing power and price power capabilities, at least three doublings, a factor of 10. Oh, that means every five years, we have an order of magnitude change in what at least the computing aspect of our capabilities might be, like it or not. So S curves, there's there's a metric, and I think that was part of Hamming's insight. There was just to connect those, the the uh, not only the transitions of processes, but to say the economics, roughly an order of magnitude, and then you can do the extra math to get to oh, every five years is a good thumb roll that we'll be doing it differently and however we're getting it done now. All right, so uh, uh, tons of opinions on that topic. Let's finish out this chapter. Um, he talks about special purpose chips. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this topic by other people. Do we do a chip? Do we do it in software? Uh, beware, yeah, but uh, an even better point that is is buried in what he's saying there is that uh, uh, software equals hardware. If you can do it in software, you can do it in hardware. If you can do it in hardware, you can do it in software. So if you do an ASIC, there it's it's just trade offs and changes. So let me uh, see if I can get the right window up. Um, there was a cool article, and some of you may know all about this stuff, but saw about it just a week ago. And I'll add this to the notes, Xenobots. Anybody here on this call know about Xenobots? Okay, yeah. uh, uh, Xenobot is, sorry, was that somebody? Sorry, Xenobot, say again. You're saying yes to Xenobot. Okay, I'm sorry, keep it going, I apologize. Okay. So uh, is the screen coming across? Try again there, Xenobots. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so you, you, you're probably familiar with artificial life and other things where people do software to try to mimic mechanical processes and try things. And these sort of hit a high water mark for a while. Uh, it's a part of AI, it's part of machine learning. It's done. Well, there's a group, uh, a couple of groups now that have taken uh, and it's coming after after the uh, named after this frog and how they use some of the skin tissue, which is uh, embryo skin tissue, which uh, is very adaptable. And basically, they're they're creating micro machines out of uh, living tissue, and they're teaching things to do stuff, and they're following machine learning and artificial life techniques to bridge from information to morphology to mechanics and dynamics and do stuff. Oh, so uh, I'll send the New York Times article around. It's pretty revealing, uh, but it's, uh, it's interesting and maybe not too surprising that we can get from information to mechanical and then maybe even to uh, living things and uh, living prosthetics or other devices that the more we do, the more we do. And the barriers between disciplines uh, start falling away with the higher and higher computing power. Some readers of Hanning might say the higher and higher our understanding. Okay, so hopefully that was something for everybody to disagree with everywhere and uh, stand clear because the jury's still out. Uh, it's still moving too fast. But uh, parting shots by anybody. We'll take a break on this one and then uh, I'm going to restart the recording for the next two lectures. Okay. See you in a few minutes.
Make sure to save your chat before you kill the uh, recording. Oh, uh, good news. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, Zoom is saving all the chat for us just fine. Oh, it does on the way. All right. Great. Okay, thanks. But I'll do that as precaution anyway. Thank you, Lauren.